Disclaimer, please check your playback settings. Ensure you are listening to this podcast at normal speed. Unless you want us to sound drunk, then play at half speed. Thank you. Where the hell is Tom? I don't know. I, I, I thought we were going to do a thing tonight. God damn it. You know what? I'm calling him. Hold on. Yeah, hoy, hoy. Where are you? I thought we had something planned tonight. Oh, it's you guys. Yeah, sorry about that. Third night at my new job. Kind of like this week's movie. Taxi driver? So is he driving a taxi then? All I know is my ass is going to be sore in the morning. Or is he a prostitute? Shush. So, another job? Yeah. A family friend paid me, like, a lot of money to do it the first time. I was like, I can make money from this? So, here I am. So is doing it really that easy? (laughs) Oh, yeah. It is stupid simple to get clients. Some pay in cash, you know, for privacy reasons. I'll be honest, though. It is definitely a young person's game. (laughs) How's that? Dude, they can go all night, some of these guys. When they get tired, just drink a cup of coffee. Boom. Ready for another round. Oh, hang on. That's going to be around $50. Sorry, give me one second. So, sounds like you got a good grip on it. Gross. Okay, so, um, are you going to get off? I, I, I mean, are you finish up? I mean, uh, be done working soon? Uh... Probably not. I'm, I'm just about to do a group here, and then there's a bachelorette party, and then there's... Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. That'll be $75 with your friends. Hey, the dog stays outside. Fine, $80. Uh, guys, I gotta go. I'll, I'll chat with you later. Okay, yeah. um, have a good time. Yeah, bye. Bye. So, uh, what do you want to do now? Ice cream? Yeah, that sounds good. Meanwhile, on the other side of town... Uh, guys, I gotta go. I'll, I'll chat with you later. Okay, hey, um, um, have a good time? Yeah. Bye. Bye. Sorry about that. And you know what? You can bring the dog. Are we doing this? Yeah, let's watch a movie, guys. <laughs> Kid, you're almost there, so I don't want to see you give up yet. I know Xander Berkeley and Heat is looking scary, but I want to see you tear right through him on your way to Robert De Niro and the Untouchables. I want to see you get mean against Charles Martin Smith in Starman. Otherwise, you'll never make it past Jeff Bridges in the last picture show. But... If you got the guts to take on Sybil Shepherd in Taxi Driver, then I know you got the heart to go one-on-one with Joe Spinell in Rocky. Now get in there! Step into the squared circle every Tuesday at firepitpodcast.com as Dan, Tom, and Josh start on their marathon to pound town. Taking on all the heavy hitters, going the distance against the heavyweight champion of boxing films, Rocky. Rocky. It's hope. It's heartbreak. It's haymakers. And it's here here at the fire pit. You're a wrecking machine. Good evening, bots and listeners, and welcome back to the Fire Pit Podcast. I'm Dan, taxi driver named Big Tony, and we welcome you to another episode of the Fire Pit. I just said that. Redundant. Amazing. Our... Who writes these things? I I don't know, but we really need to look into getting someone else to do this. But hey, back on track, our marathon to Pound Town has seen us try to rob a bank, stop bootlegging, fall in love with an alien that looks like our dead husband and try and fail to escape the clutches of a small town in Texas. And tonight's episode is sure to be another interesting one. As per our rules, we've taken an actor or actors from our last film and moved them onto this one. So now, to give us an idea of what we're watching and who we're watching, I'll hail Josh. Why, thank you, Dan. Thank you. Josh here. Taxi driver name Joey Numbers. And last week, we saw Sybil Shepard and Jeff Bridges try not to fail to be the terrible people in the terrible Texas town in 1971's The Last Picture Show. Tonight, we follow Sybil Shepard to see Bobby De Niro again, or as we like to call him, Bobby D. You're not friends. Says you. 
in 1976's Taxi Driver. This is definitely a movie that's sure to be an upbeat comedy as a taxi driver gets lost in New York City in the 70s. And if Joker's taught me anything, 1970s New York was hilarious. So uh, to give us a rundown on this film and maybe some production info, I'm going to go ahead and turn on my turn meter for Tom because I've got to get every possible scent out of this guy while he talks. Tom? Hey, yo, yo, yo. Thank you, Josh. Hey, you want to ride? Tom here. Taxi driver name Little Ray. Not not even medium size Ray. Not big Ray. Just little Ray. Come on. Just read the script as written. And as mentioned tonight, we're watching 1976's Taxi Driver, starring the aforementioned Robert De Niro. Bobby Sibyl D. Ship. Oh my God. This is going to be all night, isn't it? It's just going to be a thing all night. All <laughs> yeah. night. This taxi drives all night. All night long. All night. Ladies and gentlemen, my microphone will be muted through most of this episode of the Fire Pit Podcast. But this also stars Sybil Shepherd, Harvey Keitel, and introduces Jodie Foster. And welcome to the podcast, Martin Scorsese, our first film reviewed by the legendary actor and hater of all things superheroes. I think we got three of the four like Mount Rushmore's now on the podcast. Do we now? I yeah, because we, well, we've had Spielberg a couple of times, and yep. uh, I would say I would put James Cameron on that yep. list. Mm-hmm. And now we got Martin Scorsese. Honestly, I think the only movies we haven't done, we haven't done an Oliver Stone film yet. Ooh, I've got some ideas for some of those in the future. Would you put Carpenter up in that uh, echelon? Eh, Carpenter's Mountain kind of. Yeah, I don't know if I put away later on. <laughs> John Carpenter's worthy of maybe a monument, like a statue, but he's not like I wouldn't put his face on a mountain, like a Mount Mount Rushmore. So no, I would say, yeah, I would say right now we got Spielberg, Cameron, and we Martin Scorsese, and we haven't done. I would put Oliver Stone as number four. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But then, Tom, continue on with the numbers, please. We'll uh, we'll go on this later. Yes, we will. For Taxi Driver, the release date was February eighth, nineteen seventy six. It has a running time of 114 minutes, a budget of $1.9 million, and a box office of $28.4 million. Not too shabby a take. Made a couple bucks, that's for sure. Just a few, just a few. Yeah, they kept that meter running fast. And speaking of fast, that Rotten Tomato score is sitting nice and pretty at 98%, with an audience score of 93% and an IMDb of 8 out of 10. Not our highest rated film we've watched, but it is up there, I must say. And what is up there also are the productions of this film. So you ready for a little production knowledge, team? No. Yeah, we can skip. Oh, thank God, because I didn't have anything at all. (laughs) Nope. Tonight we are watching... Taxi driver, tagline, on every street in every city, there's a nobody who dreams of being a somebody. Summary, a mentally unstable veteran, played by Bobby De Niro, works as a nighttime taxi driver in New York City, where the perceived decadence and sleaze fuels his urge for violent action by attempting to liberate a presidential campaign worker and an underage prostitute but not at the same time. This is an original film, not based on any book or anything else, but it was loosely inspired by the writer's own bouts of insomnia at the time, which led to him frequenting pornographic bookstores and theaters because, well, what else are you going to do at four in the morning in New York City? It was a different time. We didn't have the internet back then. Yeah, this is definitely pre-Giuliani, New York City. (laughs) Yes, But behind the camera, we've got a husband and wife team producing this film. Julia and Michael Phillips. Uh, Not a lot of movies to their credits, but they had a few string of hits in the 70s. Uh, The Sting before this and Close Encounters of the Third Kind after this. Uh, They kind of lose their touch in the 80s, but that's a story for another time. This movie was written by Paul Schrader. I pronounced that right. Excellent. Paul Schrader, a dramas and crime thrillers kind of guy. He loves those grim and gritty films. He did The Yakuza before this and would later on go on to do American Gigolo, 
Raging Bull, The Last Temptation of Christ, and then later on, Bringing Out the Dead, or Taxi Driver with Ambulances. Um, his philosophy uh, when writing, which I like, so I'm mentioning it here, when screenwriting, be prepared to drop your pants and show your dirty laundry. If you can't do that, you better find yourself something more polite. And I, I, I kind of think sums up his career as a writer. Not that he's shitting his pants. It's just he ain't afraid of showing it. But this film, as also noted by Nigel, directed by one Martin Scorsese, a dramatic thriller director with a career going back to 1959 and one of the premier new Hollywood directors that came up in the late 60s and early 70s. Most modern audiences know him as the guy who doesn't like Marvel films. But and the gangster movie director. He's he's a, he's a gangster movie director. Like, he's pretty much most of his movies were gangster movies or crime yeah. movies. And Rings like Leonardo he, DiCaprio, right? He's, he's definitely big on DiCaprio anymore. Wolf of Wall Street being one of his films. The Irishman being the, another recent one. He's he also, did Shutter Island, right? Yes, he did. And with, The Departed. I would uh, love to do love the, the, the movie. I, would, I want to do The Departed really bad on, on, on this podcast someday. I forgot he did The Departed. Nice. So uh, he's still a very relevant director to this day. He also did The King of Comedy, which, as I've noted in the past, is just the Joker without the Joker. But in front of the camera, this is not exactly an ensemble cast, but still some pretty solid up-and-comers who would eventually go on to be big names, uh, as noted. Robert De Niro, Jodie Foster, Sybil Shepard, Harvey Keitel... Peter Boyle, who is a returning face on this podcast, having starred in the Fire Pit classic. Don't say it, don't say it, don't say it, don't say it. Swashbuckler! God damn it. We've gone like five episodes without mentioning that. <laughs> Take a drink. Now, we've already discussed Civil <laughs> Shepherd in our star, in our previous episode, so I'll be focusing on De Niro and Foster. De Niro, a returning face. He plays Travis Bickle, a character and method actor, uh, sometimes confusing the two, depending on what role he's playing. He was our lead criminal in Heat back in episode 78 and our Al Capone in Untouchables in episode 79. This is his third spot on this journey. And he's coming back to play another criminal of the insane variety. We've seen older De Niro. We've seen middle-aged De Niro. Now we get to see a young and hungry De Niro. And hungry as well is one Jodie Foster playing Iris, another performance character actress. She was a child actress at this point, mostly TV roles, including the voice of Wednesday Adams in an episode of Scooby-Doo. Scorsese cast her in one of his earlier films called Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore, which is probably what got her... Her role here and this role got her noticed. It got her out of the child star kid roles and into serious roles such as Silence of the Lambs way later on, Contact and The Brave One. And finally, the premier character of this film, New York City, the Big Apple, the city that never sleeps. This city is as much a character as the characters in this film. Dan will have more about this star of the 1970s and 80s America, I am sure. So I will not say much more other than that. This makes me really glad I did not live in the 70s and 80s. But in short, this looks like a grim and gritty film by solid up-and-comers who will become the bedrock of Hollywood to come. So now that we know the production behind the film, Dan, you want to share some of that sweet, sweet trivia? There is. There's a bit of trivia about this film. Some of it good trivia, like interesting stuff. Some of it tragic and very bad. Not not bad as far as like the movie goes. I mean, like I said, this is, supposedly I've never seen it, but it's it's a solid film. So, I mean, it, the movie itself doesn't have like a lot of like troubled production problems and stuff like that. But as Tom alluded to, the city of New York is very much a character in this film. So for our younger audience out there we honestly don't know who's downloading this thing so we don't know what your ages are we're going to assume that some of you out there were born 
in the mid eighties to mid nineties and don't quite know what New York city was like in the seventies in the early eighties. And, and I made a joke earlier. It you... goes into detail in episode 67 Nithics. I did. I did. I mentioned it in, in Nithics, um, how gritty and, and dark and uh, not great New York city was back then. So yeah, I, I did go into more detail about it, but um Pre Rudy Giuliani, New York, Rudy Giuliani, when he became the mayor of New York, really cleaned up that city. But um, we're going to see what it was like before he got into office. If you have seen the movie Joker, uh, it's like that. There's garbage all over this film. Every time they go outside, there's just piles of garbage everywhere, just like in Joker. And just like in Joker, um, because it took place at the same time, there was a garbage strike going on in New York City. Uh, all the garbage workers were on strike and weren't working, so the garbage wasn't being picked up. And the strike went on for a long time, so it piled pretty freaking high. And... Um, it's very real. Like they shot this film on location in New York city and didn't clean up a damn thing. So there's garbage all over this town, but yeah, so I did go into more detail in Nighthawks about how dirty and nasty New York city is, but just like Nighthawks, it's, every bit of character in this film as anyone else in front of the camera. I just hope it's more interesting than Nighthawks. But um, the other bit of tragic trivia that surrounds this movie, John Hinckley Jr. uh, attempted to kill Ronald Reagan uh, on March 30th, 1981. He was apparently triggered by Robert De Niro's obsessive character, Travis Bickle, in his plot to assassinate a presidential candidate. Coincidentally, the assassination attempt caused the 53rd Academy Awards ceremonies to be postponed until Tuesday, March 31st, 1981. When De Niro won Best Actor for Raging Bull. Um, and uh, it's also, I, if I'm not mistaken, I believe this this is, and this is a good thing. This is the last time that someone has attempted to kill a president. At least got that far that he got to fire shots. So, yeah, but th- this is the movie that kind of, in- I, I hate to say inspired the assassin. Because that's horrible. But this is the movie that inspired John Hinckley Jr. to try to kill Ronald Reagan so he can impress Jodie Foster. So did Jody ever return his calls? I don't think she did. <laughs> I, oh. don't, I don't think she did. Well, so. I hear he's getting out soon. So Johnny boy, he's still got a chance. Yeah. Yeah. She's still out there. You know, just I mean, saying she's a lesbian, but you know, yeah, you never know. You never know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> don't, don't shoot. Has the he seen don't... Joker. Yeah. <laughs> don't see Joker. Yeah, John Hinckley, don't go see Joker on your first night out. Um, and then my last couple bits of trivia just gets a little more lighthearted stuff to, you know, kind of balance out the uh tragedy <laughs> that was a movie that inspired someone to try to kill a president of the United States. Robert De Niro worked 15 hour days for a month driving cabs as preparation for this role. He also studied mental illness during his off time when filming 1900. He visited a U.S. Army base in northern Italy and tape recorded conversations with Midwestern soldiers so that he could pick up their accent. Uh, Like I said, he prepared for the role as a late night cab driver working in New York City in 1975. One of his fares, one of the guys he picked up, was a struggling actor who recognized him from The Godfather Part Two, and and he was one. He's actually the only one that recognized Robert De Niro while he was driving a taxi. This is also because Robert De Niro wasn't quite Robert De Niro yet. This is the only guy that recognized Robert De Niro. Well, this young actor recognized Robert De Niro and slumped back in his seat and said, "You had just won an Oscar. My God, is it that hard to get work right now?" <laughs> <laughs> and that actor. Albert Einstein. (laughs) (laughs) Can confirm. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Yeah. So like, oh, shit. Did that person ever amount to anything? I don't know, because I didn't find I couldn't find the name of the actor. It was. And this is a a story told by De Niro. So Uh, De Niro Niro didn't tell his name. So I don't I don't think this guy ever like I don't think he was sharing a cab with, you know, the guy who would grow up to be, I don't know, James Spader or something like that. Like he didn't (laughs) grow up with. You know, someone who would become big in the 80s. So, no, no. Yeah. Um, also, speaking of Robert De Niro for The Godfather and all that, but between the time Robert De Niro signed a $35,000 contract to appear in this film. So he was only paid $35,000 for this movie. When it began filming, he actually won an Oscar for his role in The Godfather Part Two, and his profile soared. And the producers were really worried that Robert De Niro would halt production and ask for a pay raise. 
And Columbia Pictures was very concerned about the project and were looking for ex- any excuse to pull the plug on it because they didn't really think this movie was going to do all that good anyways. Mm-hmm. So producers were afraid that if De Niro cancels production, says, I'm not doing any more of this movie, do you give me a raise? The executive producers, the people that crunched the numbers, would have just said, never mind, we're just not going to make this film. But De Niro actually said he would honor his original deals so the film would get made. So good guy, Robert De Niro. He only made this. He only made thirty five thousand dollars making this film. I'm sure he's made more because of the residual since then. But he only got paid thirty five thousand dollars to make this film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, long term, it's worked out for him. But woo. Yeah, uh, it's that short term, man. Yeah. You know, I think that's more. And I could be mistaken here because I want to go back. But I want to say that's still more than Chris Hemsworth made making the original Thor movie. It might be. It yeah, might adjusted be. Adjusted for inflation, but, you're probably right. No, no, no. He made 15 grand for Thor, if I remember correctly. You're shitting me twice. Well, it's not because... Yeah, but unlike this movie, con- the original contract for some of the original Avengers actors was because they were going to be in multiple films. It wasn't so much that they were only going to make this much money for Thor. Yeah. It's they had signed contracts for multiple films, and Marvel was committed to making these films at the time, like regardless of... Yeah, we'll get into that if know. we ever get to an Avengers... Uh, yeah. Movie yeah. Or- if we ever do the Avengers or any of the Mar- MCU movies, or even have an MCU journey someday, we'll, we'll talk about it. But they're contracts were structured much much differently okay just ask scarlett johansson yeah so i've got some more stuff to pepper throughout the film as we watch it tonight but um that's all i've got for trivia now or else i'm going to talk for another 20 minutes so josh box office numbers i know how much you love to get box office numbers out of the 70s so yes well um true to form there's none (laughs) (laughs) so um It'll be a very short segment. So the, uh, but yes, uh, Taxi Driver, originally released uh, February seventh, nineteen seventy six. Originally grossed uh, twenty seven million dollars. Um, it was in uh, release for one hundred and fifty one weeks. Very different box office. Yeah. But yeah, it uh, it did pretty well. I mean, it made almost twenty million dollars more than its uh, budget. Hmm. Which, but um, I don't know how that translates to now money, but I think that's a pretty decent chunk of change. Yeah, I mean, especially for 1976. But um, guys, I'm I, there's no information. It was 1977 with Star Wars that got started getting information. 1977 is the earliest year the box office mojo reports numbers. Um, there's other sources, and I did find one, but. Um, yeah, box office mojo is like 1977 and onwards. That world didn't exist before 1977. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But um, do you guys care to take a whack at the highest grossing film for 1976? Uh, Jaws. Was it Jaws? I'm glad to go with Nigel's. It's either Jaws or Close no, Encounters wait, of the Third Wait, did ja- oh, okay. Jaws came out in 75, didn't it? We've, didn't, we've done Jaws. How do I not know this? Um, I want to say it was Jaws. I'm going to guess got Jaws. I'm, I'm, I'm already in it this deep. So Okay. And you're st- sticking with that one, Tom? Yeah, I'm going to follow Nigel. It's Jaws, because Jaws came before Close Encounters. Well, get ready for the knockout punch, because it was Rocky. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, our destination. Oh, no. Tom, edit that out. Oh. <laughs> Man. Good lead-in with the pun, too, Josh. Damn. <laughs> yes, Rocky was the highest grossing film of 1976. It pulled in $117 million that year, selling 55 million tickets. Damn, son. At wow. number two for 1976. Now, this is just for the year, not the weekend. It's for the entire year, 1976. Mm-hmm. Uh, number two was To Fly, which pulled in $86 million. And number three was A Star is Born which pulled in $63 million. Wow, how old is Lady Gaga? <laughs> I, I think I think I don't I think, think this that's is the, the original with I think this is the one with Chris Christopherson and Barbara Streisand. Yeah. At number 4 was King Kong for $52 million. Number 5 was Silver Streak making $51 million. Ah, Silver Streak almost was on a list of mine. Interesting. Yeah. And tonight's movie was number 15 at $27 million. 15. 15. Other notables that year was at number seven, or number six was All the President's Men. Ah. Number seven was The Omen. At number 10 was The Bad News Bears, pulling in $42 million. Um, At number 14 was Marathon Man, pulling in $28 million. Oh, that's a good film. 
Number 16, my data like this one, was The Outlaw Josie Wales, pulling in $27 million. 17 was Carrie. Number 18 was Logan's Run. And yeah, that's pretty much it for like the ones that at least I partially recognize. I haven't seen all but maybe one or two of these movies. I've seen but, a few. Uh, That's a solid list of movies. It's a definitely a solid year for movies. Awesome. A lot of those I kind of want us to see on this podcast at some point. Fully agree. But uh, tonight's movie, Taxi Driver, apparently sold 13 million tickets. So Damn. And also, I'm looking, I looked this up on the inflation calculator. So, $1 million ca- adjusted for inflation to now would be about $5 million today. And $30 million would translate to about $144 million. So, it, I, so based off of those numbers, you're talking a movie with a budget of $4 million. Mm-hmm. Making over a hundred and forty-four million dollars. Yes. So nice. So it it's a bomb. It's total, a total bomb. It's a total bomb. Yeah. I mean, can, can, do you see a sequel to Taxi Driver anywhere? <laughs> yeah, it's not selling lunch boxes. No, yeah, they did, didn't they? It was that one movie with uh, like Jimmy Fallon and Queen Latifah, right? No, <laughs> that's that's something else entirely. We never talk about that. Oh, okay. But anywho, <laughs> <laughs> anywho. That, that's all I've got for uh, box office. Um, I guess we could segue on into expectations. So, Nigel, you haven't seen this movie, right? Not that I can remember. I, I remember bits of it, and I've seen. I think I've seen it on TV once or twice growing up. Like you know, flipping channels. It's probably on AMC or something at some point in time. But I've never sat down and watched it. Hmm. So, what are you expecting from this movie? Well, I mean, it's. I'm expecting a good film because it's it's highly rated. It's um uh it's got you know plus ninety percent on Rotten Tomatoes, um so I honest to God when it's usually that highly rated I don't hate the film you know so I'm expecting a solid movie plus it, it's got De Niro in it and I do like De Niro I think he's a really good actor and mm-hmm. he, you know he was good when in, in his early days he was good in his middle age days and he's still a good actor as an old man so yeah yeah I I like Robert De Niro um so. I'm, I'm going to have to say my expectations are pretty high for this film. And also it's, it's, it's one of those movies that's considered like one of those like classics you have to see. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I'm expecting to like this film tonight. And also, I mean, so far I've liked every movie on this journey. So I'm hoping that trend continues tonight. So Josh, have you seen this movie? I don't think I've seen it in its entirety, but I believe I have seen bits and pieces like, um, trying to think back i think i've seen probably 20 to 30 percent of the movie just rough ballpark i know what i've seen i've liked um i know i've seen the j- memes i've seen the jokes the uh stuff like that online um but uh, i don't think i've seen the movie start to finish but like you i've got high expectations for this film i'm honestly expecting to come out of this movie liking it like uh probably similar to my final thoughts on uh Last week's movie, The Last Picture Show, except I think I'm going to enjoy it more, or let me rephrase, I'm expecting to enjoy it more while I'm watching it. Like The Last (laughs) Picture Show, the first half, I was very much like, this movie sucks. It wasn't until the second half kicked in that I was like, okay, I see what you were doing. Yeah. And on top of that one, this one, it's like, well, no, Last Picture Show had 100% on Rotten Tomatoes Mm 2. This one's got a 98. So I was expecting that one to be good, but I wasn't expecting to like it. But I'm expecting to like this one, and I'm expecting it to be good. And I have, like I said, I've seen parts of it, so I've got high hopes for this film. Okay. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Tom? I also have never seen all of this movie. Oh, so uh, we're going into a movie where the three of us really haven't seen it. Yeah, I remember it was back in high school, the first time I tried to see it. Uh, my friend John and I just got a bunch of movies. We rented them. Um, and we're just going to have like stay up all night, just watch movies, cook food and just hang out. I can't remember all the films we had on that marathon. I think it was uh, Pulp Fiction was one of them. Um, Akira was on that list. And I can't remember the final film we wound up watching, but somewhere in there was Taxi Driver. And I remember us starting the film and I blinked. And it was done. I had fallen asleep. And ever since then, I have every time I try to watch the film, either something comes up and I can't finish it or it's really late 
and I'm tired and I fall asleep. That's not a knock against the film. It's just, I guess, past me knew that I would be watching it here and wanted to save it. Or I'm just a, a wuss, I guess. I don't know. Probably both. Probably the latter. As Dan said, um, this is one of those films you have to see. It's on so many lists. It's on so many top fives, top tens. You, you gotta see the film. But Mike, everyone else here, I pretty much know the beats and the quotes. It's not like I'm going to be surprised by anything, I don't think. I don't think any of us are going to be surprised by anything that happens in this film. Then again, I've never seen all of the films, so there might be one or two beats. But yeah, I'm glad I'm watching it in a good mood. That's another reason why I've never actually finish this film i always seem to start it when i'm in not the best mood and i'm not in the mood to watch the film now i'm in the mood to watch the film so i think that'll help uh but those are what i'm expecting i'm expecting that now that i'm in the mood for the film now that i'm not falling asleep i think i'm going to be okay with it yeah i will say this though tom is if i do like this movie um i will have to tip my hat to you on picking a solid list because, I mean, I would say that my low for this one was untouchables, but we'll go more into that next week. But <laughs> yes, like I said, I hope if I, I hope to like this movie. I mean, it's, but uh, I don't, yeah, I don't see too much. I mean, I've never heard anything too off about this film. It's not like it does anything bizarre. It's not like no one's ever said it's like buckaroo bonsai. Let's just put it like that. Well, I know a lot of uh, when Joker came out, there was a lot of comparisons to Joker. Mm -hmm. And um, like, I, I will admit Joker was slow, but Joker was one of those ones that had the good payoff. Yes. Apparently this was heavily in, or this heavily inspired it. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of curious to see the parallels in that. Like, I wonder if it's going to be another situation like last week where we were glad we watched Midnight Special or not last week, but two weeks ago when we watched uh, Starman, like we were glad we watched Midnight Special before we watched Starman. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if this is going to be a similar situation where we're glad we watched uh, Joker before we watched Taxi Driver. I'm also going to say this little bit of move or trivia for the podcast. We have not watched a movie where the plot takes place at any point in time in the 21st century since Terminator 2, where the scenes took place in the future. That's it. All the movies on this list have taken place before 1999. And we won't because Rocky takes place in the 70s as well. So on this journey. Yeah, this journey. We've watched no movie that takes place in the 21st century at any point in time. We'll fix that. I mean, we have stuck around for. No, 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 no. I'm saying it. That's not a knock. I'm not knocking it. I'm just saying I'm, I think that this is amazing that we've been watching all these films and none of them take place in the time that we're in now. You know, like none of them are modern films. We've been watching some pretty classic movies. That's what I'm trying to say. Like, yeah, and you know. or even the setting isn't modern. Like, I yeah. was thinking the same thing in a meta sense. Like, you had the 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 Untouchables, which takes place in the 1930s. You have uh, the Last Picture Show, which takes place in the 1950s. We're now this one's taking place in the 70s. So we're we're getting kind of glimpses of america through the mm -hmm. 20th century yeah yeah so that's that's an interesting way of looking at it too this journey has been a marathon not just to pound town but through america kind of yeah well and then if you think about it heat was the 90s yeah oh yeah oh my god I so heat was uh yeah he he, he was the 90s untouchables was the 30s starman was the 80s mm -hmm. um last picture show was the 50s and this is the 70s yeah and rocky will be the 70s as well so yeah so we just missed a missed a movie from the 60s yeah well we'll try to fix that next time but no this is definitely considering our last journey was mostly 80s with a, a splattering of 90s in there we, we're varying it up a bit we're stretching it out if you will look at us expanding our horizons <laughs> But you know, this isn't a retrospective on the podcast. But uh, honestly, I think I think we're going to enjoy this movie. But uh, I may eat my words. But I am curious about those who have seen the movie. And I'm wondering if they ate their words. Nice segue, Josh. You're welcome. So, yeah. So, who has trivia today? I don't know. Hmm. Dan. Dan. Huh? What? Oh, 
Okay, yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, and that's it for tonight's show. Be sure to like and subscribe. <laughs> no, 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 no. Not only did you beat me, you embarrassed me with how badly you beat me. For two weeks in a row. I don't want to. Yeah, Tom's been spanked the past two weeks in a row. <laughs> My ass is going to be sore tomorrow. <laughs> Gross. Okay. Yeah. So standard rules apply for uh, the fire pit quiz uh, section. Standard uh, Price is Right rules apply. Uh, I will be reading off the titles of IMDb reviews. Tom or Josh will give a number of one through 10. They can't pick the same number. Whoever is the closest to that number wins the point. If you get it right on the money, you get double points. And it's who's ever the closest without going over. Within two. If we're equal distance yeah, apart. Yeah, yeah. So within two. And the winner gets to do the quiz next week. Exactly. Like I said, standard format. So Tom got thoroughly embarrassed last week. And, and the week before that. And the week before that. And the week before that. So you know what? Let's get it over with and start the humiliation now. Tom, you'll be going first. I um, do worst when I'm first, but okay. I know. So this title is So Open to Interpretation That the Plot Falls Out. So open to interpretation that the plot falls out. Oh, this this sounds like such a high one. I'm going to say it goes as high as three. I had a feeling you were going to say three. I'm going to go four. Tom is right on the money. It's a three. Oh, Boom, nice. starting off strong, finally. Okay, Josh, I thought it was just okay. Five. Damn it, that's probably right. Six. Tom is closest. It's a seven-star review. Woohoo! Okay. Oof. Tom. Doesn't look good for me. Yeah. Or does it look good for me? <laughs> okay, boomers. Tom, that's the title. That's the title. Okay, boomers. One. Two. Tom, I think he's doing trivia next week. That was right on the money. That's a one-star review. Damn. Suck it, Josh! That's three three questions down, man. Yeah, that's one, yeah, you two, got three, five. four, I five. I can't win. Yeah. Tom's got it. Yeah, even if yeah, there's only two questions left or three questions even left. Even if I get the next two on the money, I can't. Tom wins. Yep. If he dies, he dies. I'm going to break him. Give me the next question. All right. Uh, this will go to Josh. Uh, a critic's film. Critics film. Let's go eight. Probably wrong. Yeah, I'm going to go six on this one. It's a five. <laughs> Tom would have got the point for oh that, too. God. Oh, <laughs> my God. I almost said five, too. <laughs> All right, Tom. It's going to be my shutout. <laughs> All right, Tom. 130, 133 minutes of nonsense. Four. Three. Josh would have got that one. It's a one. <laughs> okay, it's not a complete shutout. Well, technically it is because you these questions don't technically count because you won. So, well, no, no, the, well, you can't. You get you get the points for the first five questions. The ones that don't count is the bonus question. Right. Yeah, because we usually go over the bonus question. So you got to give all five questions mm. to calculate the points. Tom won after the third one. Yeah. <laughs> so it was six to one. I didn't get shut out. So I'm happy about that. But uh, that was uh, Tom. Uh, Tom struck back after a couple weeks ago when I. Yeah, stopped him. I, I was safe enough for this one, baby. I'm going into Rocky. Yeah. Yeah, you wanted to do the trivia for Rocky next week, huh? I want the Rocky. All right, well, Is you know there, what? Are there any um, bonus? <clears throat> yeah, what was the bonus? Okay, uh, the bonus, well, I guess, would have gone to Tom. Uh, weird, realistic. Oh, wait, who had the last one? It would have gone to me. Oh, okay, Josh. Weird, realistic, and horrifying. Eight. Damn it, that is probably right. I'm going to say nine. Josh is closest. It's a seven. Nice. Uh, you know, I should have went seven, but that's... Yeah, but Tom didn't. thoroughly... Tom didn't get spanked. Tom did the spanking. <laughs> um, <laughs> Whose ass is going to be sore tomorrow now? Let's... <laughs> you, know, you, you know what? You know what, Tom? You know what, Tom? What? Fuck you. <laughs> and play the music. another Big Apple episode of The Fire Pit. I am, as always, your interspersal host, editor, and personal taxi driver, Tom. What, just taking you up the block? Psh, ain't no thing. You'll find this ride to be as fast as my prices are fair. 
<laughs> but thank you for taking a ride with us here at the fire pit. We've gone through old towns and bold towns on this marathon to pound town, but now we're hailing a cab and riding on through towards our final stop, the one and only Rocky. And we couldn't have made it this far without today's sponsor, Podbean! You heard it right, folks, we have a new sponsor! Which, incidentally, is the site that hosts us. But who cares? A fair is a fair! Yes, this podcast is both hosted and sponsored by Podbean. Podbean is the easiest way to create your own podcast. We use Podbean to host the fire pit once a week, every week, Minor surplus a few days where we have to um, <clears throat> adjust things. But Podbean is amenable to whatever our schedule requires. So download the free Podbean podcast app to start, record, and publish your very own podcast in minutes. Podbean provides everything you need to run your podcast. And you can record and publish episodes directly from the app on your phone. So download the free Podbean app today. That's P-O-D-B-E-A-N Podbean. So head on over to Podbean at www.podbean.com and use the code PODCAST21, that's the number 21, not the word, for your first 30 days of podcast hosting for free. Podbean's worked for us we're sure it can work for you, so check it out. And speaking of checking out, let's check out how the team is faring with Josh's training so far. Yo, Tom, what's up? Hey, I'm super busy tonight, but I wanted to know if you guys got my text. About the training thing? Okay, what's a bacon bar? And why do I want it? Yeah, I'm going to need you to make sure Josh sticks to his training regiment. It's muscle confusion, remember? So I want you to pump it hard and pump it strong. I'd want to see him sweat. Right, right. Um... Hey, Tom, what's up behind you? Wait, what? Hey, wait a minute. Hey, Tom, how's work? What are you and Dan doing? Well, we just discovered a bacon bar. It's this, like, all-you-can-eat thing. It's awesome. Bacon, bacon. <laughs> Everything has bacon. What? No! No! Bad! Bad calories! You have to get ready, sir! Get ready for what? I guess I am wearing underwear today. Josh, put Dan on. Oh, okay, give, give me a second. <clears throat> Hi, Tom. What's up? That's a great impression. Dan. Seriously, what are you doing? You need to take him to the gym and start him on the muscle confusion. We've gone over this. Um, I, uh... Tom, what's that behind you? Oh my god, where? Oh, you sons of... Did you just hang up on me? Tell Tom about that bacon triple fudge brownie caramel sundae that I ate. Yeah, Tell him yeah. Like how big it was. Josh ate a really big sundae at the bacon place, and it even had bacon on it, and it was drizzled in bacon grease. It was amazing. What? How? You just hung up with me five seconds ago. No, it's, but it's okay. Josh ate most of it. Josh no. ate all of it. Because my, I, I, Josh ate all of it. No. Because yeah, I won the prize. Tell him I won the prize. That's not how this wall. is supposed yeah, yeah, yeah. to go. Yeah, Josh, Josh won a prize, and he gets free ice cream for like a year. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Tell, tell him about the Mohawks, too, that we got afterwards. Yeah, tell, yeah. Him, tell him, tell him. Yeah. Tell, tell Tom about the Mohawks. Getting to it. Getting Good, to did it. you at least? You got Mohawks, didn't you? Yup. We look awesome. Fine. But tomorrow, we're going to have to do double effort uh-huh. to get right. this right. Uh-huh. We've been we doing this okay. for five yep, weeks yep. now. We're not going to uh-huh. skip yeah. it now yeah. just okay. because you decided you that you Hold want bacon coma. Tom, look out! <sighs> Where- oh my god! Oh god, I hope I'm not dead again. But if you're dying to get your own ad posted on the podcast, or if you have a friend whom you're dying to get shouted out, or if you're just dying to get something off your chest, then feel free to email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com 
That's Curtain Call Entertainment, INC at gmail.com. Just be sure to put Fire Pit in the subject line as well as why you're emailing. Whether it's to have us talk about your products, recommend a journey, tell us of a journey you wish we'd taken, share some personal trivia that you found on a movie we've watched, and roll it on over. From there, we'll read it. Put it on the night shift in the seedier part of 1970s New York. Get it embroiled in a vigilante one-man war on crime. And never respond. This is exactly why we take the bus instead. But that email again is curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Capital C, capital C, capital E, capital I, at gmail.com. Hey, yo! Alright, so 20 miles over 3 hours, multiplied by tip, that'll be $25 in 70s money. You know what? I'm just going to say that this ride is on the house. I'll let you get back to the episode. Thank you all for listening, and as always, good luck. You could have at least left a tip, you cheapskate. Ah, what's the matter? And now to check on the team to see how they're enjoying their movie. Yeah, Taxi Cab Confessions is where I first learned that a man could put his face on a woman's vagina. So that's how this episode starts. (laughs) Bar, bar, bar. Pawn shop, bar, porn videos, bar. New York was very different before Giuliani became mayor. I'd have to say better. Can I help you? Yeah, what's your name? My name is Travis. My friends call me Bobby D. Oh my God. (laughs) May 10th. Thank God for the rain, which has helped wash away the garbage and the trash off the sidewalks. I'm getting Rorschach vibes off of him already. He has the worst live journal entries. Travis, look, piece of Errol Flynn's bathtub. The watermark. Well, we collected some really weird shit before the internet was invented. Oh, wait, we still collect really weird shit. It's just easier to find now. Does he bother you? No. You really mean yes, and you're being sarcastic. Oh, you're quick. quick. Well, I try to be real quick. You know, most girls don't like to hear that from a dude. Title of your sex tape. <laughs> <laughs> Does that say Palpatine? Yeah. Palantine. <laughs> Sorry, that, that margarita was the size of my head, man. Letters don't make words right. Well, if he had been Italian, he might have been a thief. If they kill a stool pigeon, they leave a canary on the body. Apparently, it's symbolic. In the days before the internet where you couldn't just look this stuff up to see if the guy's being dumb. You had to take his word for it or go to the library. Who is going to go to the library? They don't have libraries in New York. I think that you are the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. But what do you think of Charles Palantine, the man you're volunteering to help elect president? I think when he called for a vote of no confidence in Chancellor Valorum, it was the smartest thing a person has ever done. And I fully, fully supported Senator Jar Jar Banks and... Um, Palpatine, Josh. Palpatine. It's funny when they were casting the role that she plays, the agent was like, "We need a Sybil Shepherd type to play this role," and the casting director was like, "Why don't we just get Sybil Shepherd?" <laughs> so they did. <laughs> Brilliant, Bob. You've done it again. That's twenty dollars in nineteen seventies money. Yeah, that's like five thousand dollars today. No, five thousand and twenty. <laughs> yes, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna dispute that. You're the numbers guy. <laughs> it was the size of my head. <laughs> I don't like these movies. Well, I mean, I, you know, I didn't know that you'd, you'd feel that way about this movie. I don't know much about movies, but if I enjoy- oh, I suddenly want to quote the pack lids from Lower Decks. <laughs> Why you no like movie? <laughs> I like movie. <laughs> We you saying Robert De Niro's character is a packlid? <laughs> it tracks. Whatever ever becomes the president should just clean up this city here because this city here is like an open sewer, you know? It's full of filth and scum. Sometimes I go This out wasn't scripted. I think this is actually his rant bad. about New York City. How is your campaign going? How do you feel it's going? Like, I must tell you that I am more optimistic now than ever before. The people are rising to the demands that I have made. And you know what? I am the Senate. I love democracy. Not Alpatine. 
They Fuck. ate so healthy in the 70s. Look at this. Cheese on pie and... Like toast with jam and then a pound of sugar. She just poured on top. I need to go check my blood sugar. Sport never killed me. He killed He's someone. a Libra. He's a what? I'm a Libra too. That's why we get along so well. I'm a Libra and that means absolutely nothing. You talking to me? No, I swear to God. You talking to me? He was. Points at Josh. Bobby, it's me. You talking to me? <laughs> Bobby. Ah. Bobby, don't you recognize <laughs> us? So Bobby D's body count, this one was what, four? Well, if you account for inflation, really that body count's probably like 35, 40. No longer will we the people suffer for the few. I fight for democracy, for the republic. I have the high ground. Josh needs to be cut off an hour ago. It was one drink. I had one drink, goddammit. It was the size of your head. Oh my god, it was the size of my head. <laughs> There is no way we can repay you for returning our Iris to us. Well, he saved uh, Jodie Foster or Iris from a life of uh, prostitution and probably a early death to a life of therapy and PTSD. It was the 70s, so um, I don't know so how much therapy she was going to get. Yeah, he basically just doomed her to a life of alcoholism. Lots of alcoholism. The 80s are coming up, so cocaine. So, better? I'm just wondering, if I shoot Ronald Reagan, do you think Jodie Foster will finally notice me? I don't know. Give it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> that is the worst pun ever! <laughs> <laughs> that stays in! And now... Back to the episode. Yeah, I got this, like, I had this thought, like, the first half of the movie, but I didn't write it down. But it was like, oh, this really reminds me of Starman for this reason. Oh. And I'm like, what was that thought? You know, I was actually thinking um, while watching Starman, I, I really wish I had watched Iron Man more recently because that scene where he's eating the apple pie and he just takes the bite, a couple bites, and he's, like, looking at her. I felt like I should have said that line from Obadiah Stane. You think that just because you create something... It belongs to you. <laughs> <laughs> Missed opportunities. At least he didn't ask for cheese on that pie. Seriously. Yeah, the only way to make it better. Better or worse? <laughs> All right. Trick question. Worse. Much worse. So we just got done watching. Yeah, I'm doing the lead, in. the lead in. Jesus Christ. Tom, I thought I had the lead in. When I talk. You oh. have the first thought. Yeah. I said, Dan, you have... The I said it three times, didn't I, Dan? Yes, you did. Clearly, somebody's oh. eating his pie with sliced cheese on top. Oh, gross. American okay. cheese, Ugh. which makes it the most American apple pie ever. This might Dan, go ahead. Just just, yeah. just go. So, we just finished uh, Taxi Driver, the coming-of-age comedy from the 1970s. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh no, it wasn't a comedy at all. But uh, a good movie, I think. But my thoughts are coming last. So I think we'll start with Tom tonight. I kind of wish I hadn't seen Joker before I saw this film. Or uh, Bringing Out the Dead. Thank you. That was my thought. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> you just made me remember my thought that I forgot. <laughs> You're welcome. No, if I had seen this movie first... I think I would have liked it a lot more, but those films built on the template that this film did. I won't go too much into directing because I think we can all agree that for what this film was, the directing was exactly what it needed to be. And bless Scorsese for being the director at the right place and the right time to make this film what it was. And also, I guess, for New York City to being the garbage dump that it was. Um, and also Gerald R. Ford for not bailing out the city and making it the cesspool it was for this film. But back to the story. Really, Bickle's character definitely felt off through the first half of the film. Much like um, last picture show, the first half is getting to know the character, getting to really get familiar with them, realize there's not something there 
with this guy. Nothing obvious, nothing in your face. He doesn't, he's not screaming at people and spitting at them right away. But you tell that there's something not there. But the fact that he tipped because a chick said no to him in the face of everything else going wrong around him just rings hollow. Especially when you had other movies that are Taxi Driver inspired, where the main character's slip is more relatable, more personal, easier to track. You're not along like, okay, that makes sense that you would want to try to assassinate a politician. Just saying. As opposed to, oh, Sybil Shepherd turned me down because I took her to a porno. Now I'm just going to try to become an assassin. That's Then again, it did work for Hinkle. So It didn't work for Hinkle. <laughs> reality is stranger than fiction, I guess. But in that regard, I wish I had seen this first, or at least finished it first. Other than that, a very atmospheric film, well-directed. De Niro was very creepy at a level that was understandable, not weird and crazy as some other taxi driver inspired films have done so i will give it that um it felt like a relatable world even though it did kind of tip into a little more revenge vigilante porn in near the end but neither here nor there still a great film i liked it but does it deserve a legendary status well i, I actually i do kind of think that because it did help other films i, I can't judge it for being the first to do this film and others have done it better for what it is it's a great film eight out of ten solid um josh what do you think real quick dan is this the uh, bowl of margarita i drank earlier or is tom have severe gaps between his words tonight he's definitely shattering it up that's what i was thinking because i'm just like okay i'm not that drunk right no mm. okay, okay no i'm i'm well, trying to I did not write as much down as I normally do, so I'm really having to think about the process this, but go on, Josh. Okay, so basically everything you said, but different. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Honestly, um, the thing that you made, like I was beating my head trying to remember, I thought that the last two movies we'd seen really kind of culminated really well into this movie. Like, Tom, you mentioned it in your final thoughts here, but the comment you made in uh, Starman is you're glad you watched Midnight Special before Starman. Mm -hmm. And I agreed with you. I feel the same thing about this one. I think that I am glad that I watched Joker before watching this one, because I feel like if I would have watched this before watching Joker, I would have uh, been constantly like, OK, I get that, but that's just joker or that's just taxi driver they're just doing what they did in taxi driver so i was able to appreciate joker more mm -hmm. for its air quotes originality because i didn't know any better mm -hmm. and i thought that that paralleled well with uh the same thought that i had during starman but then like the last show we watched the last picture show i felt that it did something similar too in that like like you said the first half was a lot of character building and relationship building and the second half was the deconstruction of that so I just thought that was an interesting parallel these past three movies we've watched. But overall, I did really like this movie. All honesty, I think this would be easy candidate for destination film status. Like, I really liked the movie. I thought that uh, Bob De Niro did a fantastic job. Nothing, Dan? No, I'm done. Okay, just checking. <laughs> it's, just, um, it's not going to stop, so <laughs> whatever. No, we've I really liked this down. character. Um <laughs> I really liked the character, but yeah, he definitely was off. But all honesty, I'm on the fence. Like, and I, keep in mind, I know nothing of what the director or what her other interpretation there was. I'm on the fence on whether or not he was actually going to do anything at the political rally. Because mm -hmm. I, again, this is just speculation. This isn't commentary about the actual film, but just like, like it could be interpreted. I think it's one of those vague things that we always talk about that they had enough foresight to acknowledge and be like, okay, we're not going to spell it out for you. We're going to leave it up to the viewer. And I like that about it. It's like he could have just been trying to grab something to get his autograph. But hey, do you remember me? But then he saw how the um, Secret Service was acting. And then he was like, oh, fuck, they're going to arrest me. And I'm going to get jacked up. And I have an illegal gun on me, even though he wasn't reaching for the gun. Mm -hmm. So it could be up there. I mean, but it also could be he was reaching for a gun. We knew he was kind of crazy, but he didn't really have any major motivations that I saw leading him to want to shoot the uh, candidate. Aside from Civil Shepherd 
Aside from Sybil Shepherd, yeah. But uh, I think we all can agree that she was basically, uh, was her Janie from the last movie we watched? Oh, yeah. 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 No, I thought the pacing was good. Like, honestly, we were like an hour into it. And I was all like, oh, shit, we're only like an hour into it? Damn, that, that went, that flew by. Um, whereas like an hour into the last picture show, and we was like, oh, my God, we're only an hour. It's felt like four. So it's a very well paced movie. I don't think it left much like dead space. It was, it wasn't fast, but it was well paced. So it didn't leave a lot of dead air. Yeah. I would definitely give this like a high eight mid, to, mid eight, mid to high eight if I were to rate it. But, uh, that's, I feel like I'm, I'm getting to that point where I'm rambling. So Nigel last, but certainly not least, what are your thoughts on this film? I will say that I sympathize with Robert De Niro's character in one way. Sybil Shepherd makes me want to shoot people too, but mostly makes me want to shoot Sybil Shepherd. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just Sybil Shepherd, not a friend of the podcast. <laughs> no, no, no. That is qualified the characters that she plays. Yeah. Not the actual actress. No, um I kind of agree with you guys. I'm glad I watched Joker before I wa- or before I watched this. Well, you agree with me because Tom said the exact opposite of that. But um I I really enjoyed this film. I will agree with Tom that De Niro's sanity slippage isn't quite as detailed out as it would be in like, or as like other movies that have been inspired by this movie would go on to do. Like, um, honestly, I understood Arthur Fleck slippage into sanity and Joker a lot more than I understood Robert De Niro, Travis Bickle's slippage into insanity into this one. Like I way understood Joker's sanity slippage a lot easier. Yeah. Like, you know, Mm -hmm. they, they made a good, they did a good job of showing that over the course of the movie that he doesn't just break overnight. It's like, it's just, Constant push, 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 push. That being said, uh, this was a really intense film. Oh, yeah. Uh, very, yeah, very intense film. Um, one I'd never really seen before, and I'm kind of glad I did. But uh, I don't really have a whole lot to say about it. It's just like, you know, like there's some things that I thought uh, later movies have done better, but mm-hmm. I can't fault this one for being the first one to do those things. Yeah, yeah. It's like looking back at, um, say... Um man goes to the moon like the early 1910s film and the films like this is groundbreaking you watch it now with modern eyes like really this yeah same with like you know like 2001 a space odyssey like that movie's like really boring now when you watch it but like it was groundbreaking at the time because of the camera shots and the zero gravity effects and the the, th- the stuff they did with the, sh- the movie but now you watch it like put you to right to sleep uh but yeah going back to this film though um i did have a thought about it but I, I i seem to have forgot it is it about the music and how it's better than the last picture shows? Every film is better than the last picture show as far as the music goes. <laughs> I didn't hear one Hank Williams song in this movie, so very, very happy. I was thinking while I was watching it, though, like the movie made it look like he wanted to assassinate the senator, but I don't think he ever intended to shoot him. Yeah, that's what I was saying. I think yeah. the intent was always to take out the not the not until the end of the movie that it, with his motivation, but I think his whole intention was to always take out those pimps because he he had that whole thing in the cab against with the senator where he talked about how like if he was in charge or something like that he'd clean this city up, like he had this whole thing about wanting to clean the city up, and I really don't think he would have shot the senator to get back at Sybil Shepherd's character. I think it was a case of I don't know I don't know I just I I got a different interpretation of it. I don't think he ever intentioned to intention to shoot him. That's interesting because I've I'll save this for the the merge thoughts, but OK, carry on. Yeah. Or he was thinking about it at first, but then decided against it when uh, the one guy said that Jodie Foster was 12 and was pimping out a 12 year old prostitute. And he was like disgusted by that. And I mean, this was a guy that was going to a porn movie every night. So, you know, even he had limits. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I just had this this, I guess, a fan theory, so to speak, that his intention was to never go after the senator it was always about cleaning up the city mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but i think we can go into merge thoughts now i don't really have a whole lot to say about the film i, I just i thought it was really good from a just a filmmaking standpoint the story is a little weak only because later films have done sanity slippage a little bit better like just you see know. i almost want to disagree with that like i don't think that it was so much a sanity slippage like i think it was more of a uh more of a character growth was it like you know how like uh joker is more milk going bad yeah yeah that's that story is just milk going bad i think this is more you 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 just milk the cow and you set it out to let the cream rise so i think everything 
that he was was there. It just needed to rise to the top. Yeah, I guess. I mean, they did do, they did a good job of showing like his loneliness. Like yeah. he's yeah. incredibly he's a he's incredibly lonely. Yeah, like when he's in the diner and he's everyone's still talking. He's like getting his stuff. He's like that kid that's. Like oh I I hope I hope I can they'll let me sit with them oh boy yeah that, um, anxiousness almost a bit yeah and I've read that like um people who are lonely even though they're incredibly lonely in life they're almost self destructive and they habitually push people away to maintain their loneliness you mm-hmm. know and he was doing that in this film oh definitely yes definitely yes and even when in the early on his discussions every like his journal entries I. The, the handwriting, the small details just to bring this out very good. Certain childishness to him. Something on the spectrum. Just he's not vibrating well. I don't know if it was like necessarily insanity, though. I think like I think it might like loneliness. I could see that. But I don't think it was something that uh, a descent into. I think it was it was already there. We just it rose to the top and we got to see it. <laughs> And well, I, can, I, don't th- I mean, I don't think he's all there in the head, though. I really don't think he, you know, he's not exactly. Well, I, I, I like Tom's idea of his, or speculation that he's like on the spectrum to a degree. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Or something like that. But it's like, you know, Tom even said it, you know, he's kind of off. Even in the beginning, you knew he was kind of off. Mm-hmm. Um, tiny red flags. That, that was, yeah, it was the tiny red flags. You know, I mean, what kind of psychopath puts cheese on an apple pie i don't know i mean that was like 10 minutes into the movie and i already i, I had him summed up right then and there <laughs> yeah he was belittling the yeah. Super shepherd's character right when he came and like i can see you're lonely you have a pathetic life yeah. you can't i mean you can never do better than me so you want me to take you to a movie like, like i think if uh i don't want to say i don't want to do like a modern day type but it's like if they would have started the movie out with him having apple pie, and then at the end of the movie he has cheese on his apple pie, that would be more of a descent. I think this was more of a. It's always there, <laughs> but this. But it's just like we needed to. The, what, what's the what's the uh, term when it's like everybody has their limits, their breaking point before they you know go into the bank and you know with a gun type thing. I know they had, uh, but it's like you just got to put somebody through enough shit and they're gonna snap. They go postal, you know? Yeah, the, the the one bad day philosophy of Joker. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. Whereas it's like, I think this was just like, a, I don't think it was a slow descent. I think it was a slow build to that. Because, I mean, if you look at the end of the movie, he's almost the same person he was at the beginning of the movie. He just, you know, killed a few people. He got out of his system. He, that's all he needed. He just needed to yeah. go to a pimp, kill him, kill a bunch of Johns, and just, you know, take a nap. <laughs> He'd yeah. be fine. He was good. He's good. He's a Marine. That's all he needs. Yeah, I do agree with the with you, Dan, because you know, I even said it myself. I don't think that he was honestly going after the uh, politician when he was going up there. But again, that's just idle speculation. Yeah, I mean, I could be reading it all wrong. And it, this definitely strikes me as a kind of movie I need to see a couple of times mm-hmm. to kind of really get it. But um, Shit, the movie is like 45 years old. So it's like mm-hmm. they're, you know, the uh, director, the actors and everybody, they could have came out and be like, oh, yeah, he was totally going to shoot him. But I haven't read about that, so I don't know. No, I, I'm, I'm loving both of your interpretations on that, because I totally read that as he was going to go assassinate the senator. And he was just like, well, shit, I've well, got all these also, guns. That's one of those things, too, that um, I know pop culture has always made me think that he was like, I hadn't seen. I, I probably have seen that scene, but like when I watched it or heard about it, it's like I'd known that he goes to try to kill a senator. But watching the scene, I didn't get... I got some vibes, but I felt like that scene was so vague, vague enough that it maybe he didn't. You know, Maybe that wasn't his intention. He had like nine or ten different guns, so... I but mean, did he have them on them? I, I, I can't remember, but the, immediate, the scene afterwards when he had his shirt off, mm-hmm. did he have the gun holster strapped to him or not? I mean... When, I don't remember. I don't remember I, yeah, either. This, well, he, I think it was implied he was always carrying those guns on him. Once he bought them, he had the. He was armed like freaking Frank Castle. Because as soon as yeah, like them. I honestly thought like when he was talking to the Secret Service guy, did he was he armed up there? It's implied. because the way he was holding himself, like you notice that the hand that had the gun, he always kept it up, and he didn't. He shook the guy's hand. He shook his hand with his left hand, mm-hmm. not the hand that had the gun. Because if he would have reached, shake his hand with his right hand, the gun would have popped out. 
Which was a good catch. Did you know, did good you catch, catch, Josh. I didn't even pick up on that. Yeah. Or or what about this? How about this? I just thought about it. What if he was always intending to kill the senator until he reconnected with Iris mm. and then changed his targets? Again, it could be open to interpretation. Yeah. I don't think I would follow that school of thought, but I see where you're getting it. Yeah, I'm yeah. just saying that, like, what if the, the senator was always his target until he 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 fi- he finds Iris again and or you know, in well, you know, I guess I would have talking to go back with in. her. Well, talking with her in that scene and then going out and having breakfast with her the next day and all that stuff. Was that before or after he bought the guns? That was after he bought the guns. But like, what if like he was going to kill the senator and then he's his his rescue of Iris basically becomes his justification for Mm -hmm. for. Well, there is also he did. There was a scene where he looked at the twenty dollars. A couple twenty dollars. So he was probably thinking about it too. It's, wow, this there is a lot to unpack in this film. Now I need to rewatch it again because I'm trying to think of the timeline of when did he meet Jodie Foster? But well, technically he did meet Jodie Foster before he started buying the guns. But did he start really getting to know her before he bought the guns? Yeah, the because the Mohawk. Like I think um, he didn't have the Mohawk when he went and had breakfast with her. No, no, and then it was after the Mohawk when when you know he became the vigilante mm-hmm. and the superhero at the end of the film is when he had the Mohawk. Yeah, but I honestly don't think if I were to speculate, I don't think that he was going to shoot the senator. The why I, I just I don't coat. That's, I don't that's, know. That's the thing. That's why I'm saying it's it's open to interpretation. At least from my thing, was he ever was he really going to shoot him or was it just like that's what I think. I think it's one of those things they intentionally left it vague just to leave it open end. It's like throwing in a line so people can speculate later it's like well did he i don't know did was he you don't know i don't know and it's very i know i'm loving both of your interpretations on that because i totally read it that yeah i mean he was talking to the secret service guy earlier on in the film i mean you never know he could have been trying to reach into his thing to get the secret service guy his actual info because you know he gave him false info earlier yeah yeah like maybe i do want to do this oh wait no i think i'm just gonna go kill some pimps it does seem odd that he would try to kill a senator, fail, and like, well, I guess I'm just going to go p- kill a bunch of pimps instead. Yeah. It does seem... But then again, his whole I motivation... Mean, the, the, the lead up, I mean, he he wrote the letter. By the time you see this, I'll probably be dead. Mm-hmm. So he was planning something. But why switch gears so quickly from killing a senator to killing a pimp? I mean, is there really a difference? hey Moving on. <laughs> Again, I now I need to rewatch the film to really track that progression because now I'm not sure. Yeah, this is almost like uh, like I'm I almost want to watch it again. Yeah, to just kind of see where this stuff goes because again, I still don't think it was a descent. I just think it was a showing his true colors type thing. You mm-hmm, know, mm-hmm. I think the weakest scene of this movie, and just because other movies like RoboCop and them have done this to death is when he's in the shop and the guy is holding it up and he goes vigilante justice, which I think was still well done. Cause he, at the end is like, Oh, um, shit. Um, what, uh, I don't know what to do. I, this gun is not legal. Um, this gun's not but good, yeah. I think that was the weaker part just because I love that scene. You love that scene. I think yeah. it's, it's one of those retrospective things. This is, that's why I wish I'd seen this film before I'd seen some of the others because Robocop did it. And God, anytime like a character decides to go vigilante hero sort of thing that we like cheer them for now, it just reminded me of it's like, so it did it first, but now it seems cliche hmm. in retrospect, if that makes sense. Kind of because it was the first one. It's been done to death. I see what you're saying on that yeah, part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, I love that scene. I thought that scene was really well done. It was one of those things like he'd been training with the guns. Now he gets a chance to use it, and he shoots the guy, and he's like, "Okay, this isn't what I thought it would be." Yeah, you know, I gotta. I think I'm gonna have to watch this movie again just to see how this uh, plays into everything. Because I wonder if, where that lays in with his whole uh, reconnecting with the iris and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. I wonder yeah. if that has any effect on it. Like, because. It's like at that point he was just shooting and shooting and training and being jacked. But then like <laughs> at that scene, it's like he shot the guy and he he didn't even think. He pulled his gun out and pulled the trigger. Didn't even say freeze. Mm-hmm. You know, the guy was turning around and he shot him. Mm-hmm. Like didn't even think. And then after that, he's like, oh, oh, oh shit. 
And in true 1970s New York City, the guy who owned the shop's like, don't worry, I got this. It just started being the corpse. Like, okay, De Niro is not the worst thing in the city. Well, that city. was probably to uh, hide evidence. That's that's the vibe I got from that one. It's just like, okay, well, he was shot, so we're just going to fuck up the corpse and drag him around the yeah. corner. Or They definitely didn't have, the 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 they didn't have the forensics back then they do today. So. Yeah, so it's like you just beat the guy up. They're not going to investigate further with the gunshot. He'll be able to say that it was him. Self-defense, yeah. That's another thought I had about this film. Just like all the other characters around De Niro's character. I mean, everyone kind of seemed not quite on the level. It's kind of like um, The Lobster, where um, the main character in that film is definitely weird, but so is kind of everyone else. Everyone else in this movie, too, was just not... Right. Very third shift weirdness about them. Well, Ray Romano's dad said it um, when he was trying to ask him that one question. And then he just basically went off on this random ass speech, but ended up boiling it down to, you know, it's just the job becomes you. Yeah. 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 1970s New York. Wowzers. I think I've said all I can say about it. I like I said, I gave my interpretation of the events of the movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I think we, we could probably have a whole other episode on speculation for this film oh yeah i think at this point we're kind of like uh i think we've said our piece i think yeah yeah. at at this point yeah i mean we what we're saying i'm sure everyone else has said a hundred times about this or they're saying you guys are getting it all wrong (laughs) (laughs) whatever it's our show so and speaking of our show this is our soapbox exactly our Our soapbox. soapbox it's our soapbox and it's our show and speaking of our show that's it for tonight's show and as a reminder you can find us on fire pit podcast.com there are links to spotify itunes amazon wherever fine podcasts are bartered and sold uh regular episodes uh drop uh tuesdays at 6 p.m normally uh please like hey hey hey, we have lives this is a hobby we have jobs our editor is very overworked (laughs) but please like and subscribe to whatever medium you choose we really appreciate it helps us out uh be sure to leave a review for the podcast uh, because if you do it uh, helps us show up on searches especially if someone's searching for uh reviews or stuff about taxi driver um they'll come up with this podcast so be sure to leave a review and uh, if you want to chat with us and other fans of the show and you're on Discord, be sure to hop on over to discord.me slash fire pit. Uh, there you'll get notifications of new episodes um, and you'll get to chat with, like I said, us and other fans of the show. So we'll be able to discuss if you think that we are just completely ass backwards on our speculation and thoughts for this, you know, 45 year old movie and this video essay was written, you know, 16 years ago. You could tell us you could share the video. Um, and we will completely ignore it and say that our it's our show and we can do what we want. So uh, hop on in. Uh, it's it's fun. And also, as always, you can email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. You might have heard that sexy fellow in the interspersal segment mention this. If you want to send us a long message, a short message, a happy message, a sad message, a message about how... You're going to help clean up the city. It's up to you. Also, like our page on Facebook if you could. And when you get a chance, follow us on Twitter at FirePitCCE. Both, of course, are linked in this episode's description. Damn. Dan. Hmm? What? Shut up. What? Peggy. The meter's running, Dan. (laughs) I'm just kidding. Sir, this is a Wendy's. Describe it to me. Uh, no, I would uh, like to shout out Peggy, the OG friend of the channel. Thank you very much, for, always, for your continued support, listening, and feedback. Uh, I would also very much um, like to shout out us because, you know, like I was just thinking, it came up on my Facebook timeline that I've had my job now for a year and we've been able to adjust to the podcast, even though my hours kind of suck compared to your guys' <laughs> hours. So. And we even got through when I had to work on Saturdays and stuff like that. So a uh, big shout out to us there. So for being able to continue this podcast, even though Dan's job, well, not the worst job, Tom's job is the worst job, but while well, Dan's job, not the worst job, has the worst hours. A uh, shout out to us. And also a shout out to Zencaster, our recording platform. Always there when we need it to be there. Sometimes can be a little nerve wracking. Josh was getting incredibly frustrated with it yesterday. But that's okay. Um, it does that sometimes. But um, even though it can be a little unruly, it's always dependable. 
So yes. hasn't lost it, an episode yet. It, it hasn't lost an episode yet. So thank you very much, Zencaster. And I would like to shout out a friend of mine. Um, I've shouted him out before, my buddy Tim. We grew up together in that small town that we, uh, well, I talked about a lot in our last episode. And I was going to text him and be like, dude, you got to check out our latest episode. You got to tell me if you get flashbacks. I didn't have to because like the next day he was already texting me and be like, dude, I just finished the last picture show. Thank you for the PTSD flashbacks. I hate you. <laughs> Because he, like me, managed to get out, and we have very similar uh, feelings about that hometown. So uh, it was fun, uh, you know, hearing his thoughts on it. He thought it was a good episode. So thank you, Tim, for being a uh, loyal listener. And um, I fully agree with everything you said about our hometown, too. So, but also, I'd like to shout out um, Sync Lounge and Plex. Um, Sync Lounge, first and foremost, um, allows us to synchronize our viewings when we watch these, because we are not sitting in the same room together, but we can watch the movie like we are. And it is a very reliable piece of software. Um, and same with Plex. I've had I've been a Plex user for probably a decade. And I, it's always, it's like Netflix at home. So you have your own movies and you can watch them and you can watch them on your phone. You can watch them anywhere with an internet connection, just like they would Netflix, but you own the media. And for my shout outs, I would like to shout out two of our latest and growing Facebook followers, Martin and Luna. Luna are two of the hundreds and growing number of people who come onto Facebook to see what we're doing, poke their heads in to see new episodes come in, check out when we post something, or just in general like having us on their likes box on their Facebook page. Whatever it is, we do appreciate you, you know, keeping us in mind, keeping us on your radar. We encourage you to continue listening to us or to start listening if you have not yet and to share it out to your friends, families, loved ones, strangers, just people who are on your Facebook page as well. Whatever it is you do and however you do it, thank you for joining us and helping to keep those fire pits burning. I would also like to shout out Audacity. Audacity is the software that I utilize every week, every weekend, every hour, sometimes very literally, to take all of these wonderful recordings and all of the wise and insightful things we say and make them sound so nice. It is a free bit of software, so I am not paying a dime for it, and they are not paying us a penny to say anything about it, but I mean, we've been using it for over a year now, going into two seasons, two full seasons. Oh my God. And it has worked out for me. And if you want to do a podcast or record music or just have something to make your voice sound awesome, it'll do right by you. <laughs> and that's all I got. Really? <laughs> you want to go on for another 20 minutes? I mean, I could. <laughs> I, I mean, Please I didn't don't. talk about Harvey Keitel in the movie, and I, I could have a whole thing about Harvey Keitel. It's like me and Dan are nice. You know, we, we give them a few sentences, one thing. You're like writing them a Jordan or a Robert Jordan esque novel. <laughs> it's a Travis Bickle letter. Like, dear diary, today, Audacity, I used it to. <sighs> are you two done? I mean, not... no, I, I could go on. I mean, I've, I've, I've... Well, no, actually, Tom could go on. I, I mean,. You know so, what? You know what, Tom? Let's just I'm I'm not let's just get the boxing gloves stop, out. Going the distance no, we are it. not going the distance. I just think we need to, you know, have it out. Just give, give, get us a couple boxing gloves. Oh god. <laughs> We're feeling strong now. Yeah, I think I can whoop Tom's ass. I got the eye of the tiger. It's is this an exhibition match? I need to know up front right now. I will be naked. Next week we're going to Rocky. <laughs> <laughs> ding ding <clears throat> it's just oh, I think I broke him. he did he did oh god oh. oh you know what until then I've been Dan I've been Josh and I've been Tom thanks for listening this has been a production of Curtain Call Entertainment LLC stay safe out there
So is Tom called back yet? Mm, not yet. It's been like an hour. Okay, whatever. Where to next? I'm wired. Yeah, I think there's like a political rally down the street. At 3 a.m.? Really? Mm -hmm. Wait, is that Tom? Guys? What are you doing here? Um, just working. What the hell are you wearing? Oh, it's one of those undersuits that astronauts wear under their spacesuits to keep them ventilated. Yeah, you really need one of these things when it's your turn to wear the costume for the white... I mean... Um... It, it's just part of the job. It's no big deal. No biggie. What's that you're drinking? <sighs> that looks really familiar. Oh my god, is that a white claw? No. Look, they've been paying me really good money to sell these, and they're just so good! Give me a break! It's been a long day! Oh, for fuck's sake, not you two! Hey now, they're only a hundred calories a can. Yeah, and I don't feel so bloated after having one either. In fact, if you want, I've got some coupons! <laughs> I can't stop! <laughs> It started out as just a side gig as a mascot for White Claw. You know, walk around to the costume, spin the big sign, hand out coupons. <laughs> I started doing this for the money and then I got addicted yeah. on the stuff and now I can't stop. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. My ass is so sore. <laughs> just pour some White Claw on it. God, no. Take a sip for me. I'm going to bed. <laughs> the white claw is giving me anal discharge. <laughs> My prostate.